Welcome to worship from St. Paul Lutheran Church in Harlingen, Texas. I'm Pastor Nathan, and I'm here at a local cemetery here in Harlingen. Might seem like a strange place to begin our worship today at home, but it's a place we've got to talk about. And this day in the church here, All Saints Day, is a perfect day to talk about it. We all would like to avoid winding up here, but we know that death is coming for us. It is an enemy that pursues us. And unless Christ Jesus returns, well, we will end up at a place like this. But All Saints Day reminds us that this is not our final destination. This is not our final resting place. We look for that resurrection, and we know that by faith in Christ Jesus, those who die yet shall live at rest from their labors. So as we gather on All Saints Day, we remember those, especially in this past year, a little bit later in our service, who are part of our faith community and our families who have gone to be with Jesus and are resting from their labors, who we long to join one day in the presence of Jesus. But we also celebrate the faith of our young people in our church as we celebrate the rite of confirmation for them this day and as they share their faith with you. So, welcome to worship on this All Saints Day as we remember and give thanks for all those who rest from their labors and who one day we know because of faith in Christ Jesus, we will be joined together with for all eternity in his presence. Welcome to worship. Thank you. 
believe that Jesus came down to earth to forgive us of our sins because we couldn't do it by ourselves. He has created the entire world and sent his son Jesus down to save us from our sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Holy Son of God, part of the Trinity, who came down to earth in order to save us from our sin. Yes, I believe in the one true God who created everything. He's died on the cross and he's forgiven us of our sins. I believe that Jesus died for us and came back and forgave our sins so we could have eternal life. I believe that God sent down His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins so that we didn't have to be there and that He will come back to take us all to heaven one day. I believe that He died on the cross and rose again to save us from our sins and have eternal life. I believe that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us because we are all sinners. Because that gives me hope that once you die, you have more than just dying. It's important to be confident in what I believe in so I can uh, help tell other people about the word. It's important to know what you believe because then you can share it with other people. It's important to know what I believe so that I can tell other people about Jesus Christ. Prayer is where we talk to God and how He listens to us. Prayer is a way to connect with God and ask Him for things in your life and to thank Him for the things He's given us. Prayer is when we go and talk to God. Prayer is a way for us to talk to God, just to be alone with God and have a conversation with Him. Baptism is where God unites us in his family with the water and the word. I believe that baptism is a gift from God. Baptism is where we become children of God. Baptism is when God invites you into his family. Baptism is a gift from God. Baptism where you take the water and the word and you are adopted into God's heavenly family. It is a gift from God where we become a child of God. Communion is when we come together as a community to drink and eat the body and blood of Christ to forgive our sins. Communion is where we eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We do this when we come together to not only remember what he did for us, but also for the forgiveness of sin. Communion is where the bread and the wine become the body and the blood. Holy Communion is where we go eat and drink the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. The bread and the wine become Jesus' body and blood. And able to grow closer to Jesus by taking in his body and blood and therefore having my sins forgiven through him. I believe communion is when the bread and the wine change to the blood and body of Jesus Christ. Communion is when we gather to eat and drink the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. I want to thank my mom because she has always helped me through hard times and, and I want to also thank my dad. My biggest influences are my parents because they helped guide me in the words of Christ. I'm thankful for my parents for bringing me into my faith through baptism. The biggest influence in my faith is my mom and my grandma. I would like to thank my family for pushing me to get here and always encouraging me and not giving up. Our reading for today is 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Our reading today comes from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. 
His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let me ask you something really personal. At least it's become that way. Have you voted yet? Now, normally I wait to vote on the actual election day, even though I know there's always been other options that are available to me. I think I like to vote on election day itself because I like to think that if something changes between the time I voted and the actual election day, like a candidate passed away or something changes on an issue, I could still change my vote up to the last minute. This year, though, I did the early voting. I felt in the midst of this pandemic, it was the wisest way to me to exercise that freedom this year. But something was missing with my early voting experience that I didn't even realize I cared about so much every time I voted. And that has to do with where I put my ballot after I get it filled out. This year, I put my ballot into a regular locked early voting box. But most often when I vote, there is a box, not a box, but, but a machine. A machine that has numbers on it that are constantly going up. And I always check those numbers before I put my ballot in and after I put it in to make sure that little counter goes up one more. Telling me the number of voters who have been there and telling me that I'm one of those. My vote counted. Now, I, I know it's pretty silly because it's just a counting machine. And I didn't get that little internal reward and confirmation that my ballot counted. It's silly. But it's raised my stress level. It got me thinking that as I left there that day about all the things that could go wrong with voting. And that leads me down a pretty dangerous rabbit hole. Maybe you've been down there too. How's your stress level? If you're like 68% of the, your fellow Americans, according to the American Psychological Association, you are facing a significant amount of stress about this upcoming election. That is, 7 out of 10 of you are really stressed out about this election. Four years ago, it was only half of you. More of you are stressed than, than ever before about this. But then again, we expect this, right? Because this election is happening in the midst of unprecedented times. At least that's what we're told. The phrase that gets repeated often and often over and over again, we are living in unprecedented times. I've grown to really dislike that statement. Because it makes us think and feel that the situation we are in right now is so unique and so difficult that there, there's nowhere to go for help because we're living in unprecedented times. Therefore, there's no one we can turn to. There's no way we can figure it out. So we just turn in on ourselves, which disregards the fact that you and I have always lived in unprecedented times. It's part of our existence. It's just that we felt a little more control of our lives and the world around us. And... That control, or the illusion of control, has been taken away from us. See, it's important for us to realize this, friends. Because if we can realize this, that we start, stop, rather stop looking for the answers within ourselves, but rather that there's a place of wisdom we can turn to that can speak to every unprecedented time. The Word of God. That the author and creator of time itself has something to say to you and to me in this moment. And that in this moment, as crazy it may seem, we can even find peace. A peace even in the midst of unpleasant situations. A peace that passes understanding and lets us live out our callings, not in fear, but in faith. In a God who has been faithful to us in the past and who will be faithful to you today. 
Now to help you see how God is at work in all of this, let's, let's turn and see how some of the people of God in the past found a way to live by faith in the midst of political, social, moral, and economic upheaval. Oh, you thought your situation was unique? Sorry to burst your bubble, unprecedented times people. Last week, we spent some time in the year 587 BC with the prophet Jeremiah. And prophet Jeremiah, in his wonderful words of hope in the midst of some really chaotic times, the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed, the walls torn down, the temple wiped off the face of the planet. And yet he says these beautiful words and lamentations. But this I call the mine, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. In the midst of destruction and devastation, Jeremiah casts his hope on the steadfast love of the Lord God who remains faithful to his people and faithful to his promises. Now, today, we're going to go back even earlier than that time we're going back 18 years before this, before the total destruction of Jerusalem to the year 605 when Jeremiah was still proclaiming his warnings in, in the book of Jeremiah that we have for us to read today to the people of Judah and to repent, to change of their ways. And a time also though, when another prophet of God by the name of Daniel comes onto the scene, not in Jerusalem, but as a captive in Babylon. Daniel sets the scene for us in 605 BC, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God and place the vessels in the treasury of his God. This is not good. Judah is now under the control of a foreign power. A power who shows their might by taking things from the holy place of the temple of the Most High God that Solomon had built and furnished, and he takes these precious holy items into the temple of his God by the name of Marduk. Now, does this mean that God can't stop this from happening to his temple? <laughs> Far from it. In fact, Daniel made that clear, didn't he? He said that the Lord gave it into his hand. This is the Lord allowing a foreign kingdom to take over, to ransack his temple, and as we're going to see in a moment, enslave some of the people. But more about that later. I mean, but think about this. This is the promised nation. The nation in which God had promised to, to send the Savior of the world, the Messiah, but now it, seems like, now it seems like all that may be for nothing. Israel has become a puppet, puppet government under control by another nation that only wants to take from her. So the question and the main theme in this book of Daniel that we're going to explore here today in the next couple of weeks is this. In the midst of political, social, moral, and economic upheaval, is God still in control? Is God Sovereign. Oh yeah. About that whole capturing of some people? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar was pretty picky about those he captured. Daniel 1, verse 3. Then the king commanded Aspenaz, his chief eunuch, not a job you want, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, and learning, competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. How's that for some requirements and who they're going to take into captivity in this moment? I definitely want to make that cut for sure. But four of the young men chosen to make the cut to serve the king and to advance their education in Babylon so that they could serve the king were four men by the name of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now upon being brought into this new program, they got new names. Now they were known as Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It may seem like a trivial matter to get new names, but for these youths, these names are significant. You see, their previous names, their, their Hebrew names, they showed honor and, and acknowledgement to the Lord God that they, that they served and followed and believed in. But now these young men who had been ripped from their homes, taken to, from their homeland, given new names, and the new names, 
Well, their name's after the Babylonian gods. They're significant, trying to strip their identity away from them. These are some difficult times for these young men. But what we're going to see today and and next week too is that they don't ask the question, why is this happening to us? They don't get stuck in the past either. Dreaming about the good old days when everything was normal. No. They live in the moment because they know God's in control. And still at work, even in unpleasant situations, their hope was not in their circumstances. Their hope was in the Lord God. Now, this framework, this, this frame of mind, it shapes everything that's going to happen to them. Having their hope placed in the Lord God allows them, allows them to see that while they don't want to be in captivity, yet if God is still in control, that, that captivity, unpleasant as it may be, can still serve a purpose. That God is still on his throne, that God is still in charge. Therefore, he is worthy to be trusted when the circumstances are confusing, when the times are uncertain. The central theme of Daniel is that God is in control. God is sovereign. There's one phrase that that appears four different times in this book that kind of summarizes it, and it summarizes it like this. The most high rules the kingdom of men. The most high rules the kingdom of men. The book of Daniel will challenge us to ask, do we believe that the most high rules the kingdom of men in 2020? Do we believe that God is still in control in 2020? Because if that is how we think about and order our lives, it has an impact on the decisions we face each and every day. Decisions like elections, but also to be shown in our day-to-day seemingly small and insignificant choices when no one else is watching. Here's how it plays out in a small choice for Daniel and his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the good-looking, smart guys who were conscripted into the service of the king as they began their three-year training program. Because part of their training program was not just education of the mind and learning the language, but holistic education, eating the best foods so that they would be healthy and strong. Sounds pretty good to me. Yet Daniel doesn't think so. Daniel doesn't like this plan. Daniel 1 verse 8, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Daniel knew something was up. He knew that the food that was being served was not necessarily bad food in and of itself, but the food was connected to the, to the false gods, Babylon. Therefore, these, for these young Jewish boys, it, it was unclean. If they eat the unclean food, what it did would, would show their, their allegiance and subservience to the false gods, which is... I mean, the problem that that Judah was having at that time that that Jeremiah is talking about as well. But think about it. No one would know. No one would know if they ate the food, that they weren't following God's law. I mean, it was just a little thing. They could could do it. It wasn't a big deal. It's just a little choice. After it's the best food, it's the best wine. But Daniel, by faith, realizes that there's more at stake than there appears in this moment. So as an alternative to the really good food and to protect the person who was in charge, that eunuch who was in charge of feeding him from losing his job or losing his head, Daniel proposes the V8 diet. Daniel chapter 1 verse 12. Test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. And deal with your servants according to what you see. My four-year-old would not survive this diet of vegetables only. It's hard enough to get him to eat one tiny little pea. But for these four young men who choose to be faithful in this small matter, an incredible thing happens. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now, every mom and dad may hear this story and tell their kids, see kids, I told you to eat your vegetable. It's in the Bible. Got it right here in Daniel chapter one. Sorry to burst your bubble, parents. 
while eating vegetables is good, the V8 diet itself is not the main point. The miracle is not the diet. The miracle that after only 10 days, there is a remarkable difference between the four youths from Jerusalem as compared to the rest of the young people that are in the program eating the good food. You see, choosing to trust that God would be faithful to them in this moment, in this small choice, leads to even bigger things for these young men. Daniel gives us kind of this this summary as he wraps up Daniel chapter 1, and he says it this way, as for for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in, in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and chanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. So, four captured young men, taken from their homes, their people, and even lost their names, find themselves advising the king of the biggest and most powerful nation on earth. Is this ironic or is it part of God's plan? Is God in control and in charge? Daniel will be in this advisory position for 66 years as a foreigner in a position of influence and power in a pagan nation. And despite, despite the change in who's the king, and even in the change in kingdoms and countries that are in charge, he's still in this place. Is this his chance or happenstance that Daniel finds himself here? Or perhaps, perhaps God is in control. And he has a plan. Because if God is in control, following his word is always the best choice for life then and for life today. Daniel and his friends have hope and faith in God because they know that no matter what the circumstance, the most high rules the kingdom of men. Therefore, they can deal with whatever may come their way. A lot of times we ask the wrong questions when it comes to the things that happen in our life, either good things or bad things. Most of the times though, let's be honest, it's only the bad things that we question God about. When something bad happens, we may say, why? Why did God let that happen to me? But if we are really honest with ourselves, we could, we could really care less why he allowed it to happen. When, what we, when we are hurting, we don't care about the why. We just want the hurt to stop, the pain to go away, or never have been there in the first place. And while we may wes- wrestle with the why, I think we need to ask better questions of ourselves and of God. We need to start asking how. How, God, can you use this pain? How, God, can you and will you use this election? How, God, will you act through what I've been through and what's happened to me? Because you are the most high and you rule over the kingdoms of men. Therefore, you have the power, you have the ability to intervene in a way that that I would have preferred differently, yet you didn't. But I'm going to choose to trust you that in the midst of things I can't understand, you are still at work. So I will pray. I will pray as your son Jesus taught me to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Martin Luther in his small catechism wrote about this petition, these words. He says, the good and gracious will of God is done even without our prayer. But we pray in this petition, that it may be done among us also. His will is done when he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, which do not want us to hallow God's name or let his kingdom come. And when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith until we die. Jesus didn't just teach this, but he practiced it. On the night that he was betrayed, he's about to be arrested and he prays out to the father this prayer. Father, if you're willing, 
Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus knew the bigger plan and was willing to submit his will and control. And because of that submission with the sacrifice of his life on the cross for the payment of of my sins, I can be forgiven that through his death on my behalf and that through his resurrection, I have victory and life everlasting, which means all my suffering, all my pain has been redeemed at the cross and will only be temporary because a day is coming when King Jesus will take me into his presence, into his kingdom, which has no end. Something we remember too on this All Saints Day are those who have gone before us and rest in his presence. So what's your answer today to the question of, is is God in control? Because the way you answer the big question of, is God in control, impacts every aspect of your life. Now, before you give the right answer with your head, because you're watching worship and and you, you know what the right answer is, search your heart. Because God being in control, it means you're not. His will, his plan, will always supersede your will, your desires, your comfort, your pleasure, your plans. And if it seems that truly giving complete control to God sounds scary, then consider for a moment the alternative and how scary it would be if you were in control. Because if you're in control, your suffering has no purpose. For your main goal in life would be to avoid suffering. If you're in control, you'll spend your whole life trying to figure out why things are happening and do whatever you can to avoid any type of pain. But if God is in control, you will have less questions that start with the word why and a lot more that start with the question and the word how. And with that how will come a peace that comes with knowing that God has a plan. Romans 8.28 says this, We know that for those who love God, He works all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Not all things are good, but they work together for good. He's at work in it all. You are here, friends, for such a time as this, for such a day as this, for such a year as this. You cannot live in the past, nor can we return to it. You must live for today and every single unprecedented day that follows for the sake of your neighbor. Daniel and his friends, they were not perfect. But they strove to remain faithful to God and his word, even if it meant they were different than those living around them. And regardless of living in a pagan nation that worshiped false gods and had horrible practice, they still got involved where they could. And through their influence, the one true God used them to accomplish his will, even in politics and government, even though they never got the right to vote. That central theme of Daniel, the most high God, rules over the kingdoms of men. But the phrase doesn't stop there. And it continues with these words, and gives them to whoever he pleases. That may challenge your politics, but I hope that sentence doesn't challenge your faith. Cast your votes, but don't cast your hope. Don't cast your hope in offices and people that will surely disappoint you for your hope has already been spoken for. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So this week, as you watch returns come in from elections, don't get too excited, nor get too disappointed, because God is still in control. And the greatest return comes not at election day ballot box, but comes on the day that Christ Jesus will surely return to make all things new as he promised. And after all, he's kept every one of his promises to you. So until that day, Until that day, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. On this All Saints Day, 
We remember those who are now at rest, whose hope are fulfilled and are in the presence of Jesus, especially those we love from our community of faith that we remember with these pictures and these names in this moment. Standing with a great multitude of saints before the throne of God and the Lamb, let us join in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving to the God of our salvation. Mighty and eternal God, we remember before you the saints and martyrs of every generation who trust in you in the face of terror and dread. Grant that when facing persecution and trial in our own day, we may be steadfast in faith. Deliver those whom you have washed in baptism granting the new life that death cannot overcome. Mighty and eternal God, you established the church and have granted her your aid and protection throughout these many years. Continue to pour out upon us your spirit and grace, that we may accomplish your biding and proclaim your saving name to every corner of the earth. Mighty and eternal God, we give you thanks for the faithful pastors who have spoken to us your word and the church workers who have served us in your name. Grant that we may continue to receive their ministry of word and sacrament with willing ears and open hearts. Mighty and eternal God, we beg your grace that our lives may be ordered by your commands, and we ask you to bless those who govern us in your name. Bless our President, the Congress, our Governor, and all local officials that pursuing the path of justice, they may act with humility and honor for the good of all people. Give wisdom to all who vote this week, and bless its result, 
that our nation may elect our leaders peacefully and orderly. Mighty and eternal God, we rejoice that you have rescued us from the power of death and raised us in Christ to dwell with him in everlasting life. Give to those who grieve the comfort of the promise of the resurrection of the dead and eternal life, and bestow of your great peace upon the dying, and they may fall asleep here and awaken into your glory. Mighty and eternal God, you have made us your children, and you continue to guard us as your own possession. According to your will, give healing to the sick, calm to the trouble in mind, and patience to those facing sorrow and struggle. Give health and peace to our nation. Hear us, especially on behalf of Jamie, Grace, Edmundo, Gladys, and Lord, we ask you that you be with them and provide for them according to your gracious will. Mighty and eternal God, your Son has set a table among us, and today as we gather, may our gathering be of glory to you and encouragement to all of us, that even during these difficult times, we are able to witness these young adults coming together to confirm their faith in you by the power of your Holy Spirit. Continue to protect them as they continue to their, do their journey of faith. Mighty and eternal God, bring us to that day when every tear shall be wiped away from our eyes and we shall hunger and thirst no more, knowing you by faith. We yearn for the day when we shall know you face to face. Until the dawn of that eternal day, keep us in your faith and fear through our good shepherd and Lord, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one in God, now and forever, and who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Now was buried in me my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my doom Till I met you And I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my doom Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness to your glorious day Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old may new when I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness to your glorious day I 
I needed rescue, my sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Go in peace, serve the Lord, have a blessed week.